Good morning and welcome to our webinar, Managing Blood Cancer Between Hospital, Home and Community. My name is Mary Ann Skaparis and working alongside me here today are my Leukemia Foundation colleagues, Jenny Burke and Megan Moore. As you would have seen, the Leukemia Foundation has a patient first strategy and patients are very important to us. So we will start today's session with a recording from someone living with blood cancer. Fiona, will start, well, Fiona was diagnosed with myelodysplasia in May 2020. This is a rare blood cancer affecting the bone marrow. Since her diagnosis, Fiona has faced many hospital episodes and symptoms that need regular management. Today, she generously shares her challenges and strategies for managing a chronic disorder while living in a small rural Queensland town. Hi, my name is Fiona McQuerta. I have myelodysplasia syndrome, uh, multilineal dysplasia. I was diagnosed in May of 2020. Um, thank you for inviting me to speak on my experience of living with blood cancer and primary health care or hospital to home care. When I was diagnosed, I was fortunate to have a consistent and engaged GP and she took the time to learn about MDS. The surgery was also aware that if when I called and needed an appointment, that they would actually fit me in on the day they understood the importance of such access. The diagnosis process was made so much simpler and less frightening as the GP knew what my haematology team were up to and vice versa, both having clear understanding of where my health was situated, where I was in the diagnosis process and what might need to occur should there be any changes and it made a lot of difference to what was this already stressful situation. Uh, I live regionally so I live 700 kilometres away from my capital city but I'm fortunate that I have a treating haematology team here locally however when he's on leave there's no backfill so I have had to have hospital admissions under Brisbane haematology care who don't know me, don't know my care, my history, um, but that's one of the challenges that we face living regionally, but at least I was getting cared for, so. Um, but I've managed to put in some strategies so that I can provide a GP, consultant, hospital, or anybody with the relevant information that they need um, quickly and easily. Um, so on my phone, I have a spreadsheet where I put my latest blood results, my history, uh, just a brief history and um, my medications. I was not IT savvy at the start of this process when I was diagnosed, so everything was written on paper and I was constantly losing bits and pieces um, until my husband who works in IT took pity on me and so now we have this new system. So this system is also valuable um, because now my GP has left that practice. I now don't know who I'm seeing when I when I do go. So I have no consistent GP care. So having quick and easy access to all the information speeds the process up, especially once you're inside the appointment, they can have a quick read and then you can get to the nuts and bolts of what I'm needing or what I'm there for. Um, what has been super important in being able to access any GP has been my relationship with the practice nurse. So I'm very grateful for that. So if I get no joy from the admin team, I speak to her and she will do her best to fit me in on that day unless she's on leave and then I have to wait 10 days to get an appointment like <laughs> but anyway that's another challenge isn't it so I now ask my GP to send my haematology team a letter after each appointment I know that my team in haematology sends one to my GP so when my original doctor left the communication between one practice to another stopped or from the GP practice stopped um, and I found that this hindered treatment options um, and appointment scheduling and my care. So that's why I now ask for it to be done. And my haematology team only know that what information I, as a patient, can give them and information that is provided by correspondence from my GP. So um, frequently treatment has been modified um, according to whatever information is given from the GP because they are the ones that see me you know consistently um, that's been my experience anyway um, many of my admissions have been for febrile neutropenia apart from my last one which was because my spleen's grown really big pushed up my diaphragm collapsed my lung <laughs> um, 
Um, the lead up to the latest admission was very stressful, mainly because there was no communication between the GP and the hospital and it was left, left up to me to do it. But thankfully, I have a good relationship with my haematology nurse, which meant I could then discuss it with her, make a plan uh, of what I needed to do, where I needed to be, and that resulted in a week on holiday in hospital. So one of my GPs that I have seen um, in the last 18 months, I think it was, suggested a um, care plan. So I discovered that I was able to see a dietitian so I could get tips on eating with severe neutropenia because I love food so much. So now I'm able to safely eat things that I love, which is great. Um, I was also entitled to psychologist appointments. So navigating the anxiety between bloods and appointments, noticing the changes in my life and relationships I found and still find tricky to deal with at times. So I find accessing her very helpful. And I was so focused on what I have lost having this disease um, that I sometimes forget what I still do have. So it's nice to be reminded sometimes by a professional. Um, yeah, um, I no longer work as a nurse. I am fatigued constantly, so I can't do the shifts. I am unable to play the sports that I used to play at a high level. Um, I can't run around and do things with my kids like I used to. But I, what I do have is these appointments have given me strategies on finding a way to live with purpose regardless of what I've had to give up and without knocking the wind out of my sails every day. So I have a small MDS community um, of people around my age that have got kids, younger kids and, and that, which is really nice. And I also um, facilitate healing circles. Um, so I have a purpose and it's not super taxing on my energy levels. So um, another thing, living with blood cancer has changed all of my relationships with my children, my husband, my friends, my siblings, sibling, <laughs> my workplace. Um, what I have found useful is using the psychologist, so I have techniques and strategies on how to talk to my kids about cancer. I also explored how to maintain an intimate relationship with my husband, despite fatigue and pain. Um, human touch is very healing for me, so I find that no matter how unwell I am, if I'm being held, it makes me feel like, you know, everything will be okay, even though we don't know, like, if it will be. I've also found that it's helped me not feel so super frustrated with people who say, but you look so good. Um, my bone marrow is knackered. I'm neutropenic. My white cells are low. My platelets are 20. Um, my hemoglobin is dropping. It's ouch now in its 90s. Um, I do not feel good all the time. Um, and I can go from feeling good to really poor at the drop of a hat. Lengthy stays in hospital require an, adjust an adjustment period once we get home. I'm usually super fatigued and often have pain due to the filgrastim injections, etc. Um, I just cannot do what I used to do. I get overwhelmed trying to fit back into my busy family life. I've got five kids, but only three live at home currently. Um, once home, I ask myself, what do I need to do? What can I do to reduce my overwhelm? How can I feel good on some days when I can barely get out of bed? Um, what food can I eat to nurture my body and provide me some comfort? And how can I make this happen? Do I need to speak to someone about my fears? Maybe I should speak to someone how do I, how I navigate this latest change in my health? Have I got my follow-up appointments organized? Remind myself to be kind to myself and give myself permission to rest. Travel, goodness me, another challenge for living regionally. I've learned that if I need help coordinating this, discussing with my blood cancer support coordinator is invaluable. They help with the logistics and accommodation, etc. Patient travel pays for the flights to Brisbane, but when we get there, we have to find our own way, where we're going. It's okay for me. I have children who live in Brisbane, but not everyone is that fortunate. So linking in with a support coordinator will make a difference. And sometimes with complex care, people have their own nurse navigators, or they do in where I live, um, and they coordinate. If you have a number of appointments, coordinate it all on the same day to enable 
less travel away from home, etc. I feel the relationship with our GP can make a massive difference in our lives, not only with medical appointments, scripts and x-rays, but with referring on to other professionals in the community to make our lives easier. GPs know what services are available a lot of the time. We just need to ask the questions and advocate for ourselves. Ask for help, guidance, referrals. I want to thrive, not just survive this blood cancer. And hopefully at some point I want to thrive without it. Um, and there's a lot of resources in our communities once we know where to look. Such a lovely share from one of our consumers, one of our patients who was so willing and kindly shared her insights to living with a chronic illness. Um, certainly my takeaways are the importance of being informed and being proactive in your own self-care, um, you know, building strategies to help reduce stress. Um, some lovely tips and tricks that uh, Fiona has shared with us here this morning. Our next speaker, it gives me pleasure to introduce Professor John Emery. John is the Herman Professor of the Primary Cancer Care Cancer Research at the University of Melbourne and the Primary Care Lead for the Victorian Comprehensive Cancer Centre. He is a GP and he leads a research and education program focused on the role of general practice in cancer early detection and cancer survivorship. Thank you, John, for taking time this morning to be with us here today. Thank you very much, Marion, and thank you to the Leukaemia Foundation for inviting me. Um, I hope that there seem to be one or two um, technical problems that some people were having, but I hope that uh, people can hear and now see my slides. Um, Marion, maybe you can, can you maybe just confirm you're seeing what I hope is the right screen, please. Okay, lovely, thank you. Uh, so I'm going to be talking a, a more around the role of general practice in the care of people with blood cancer. I think um, many of the points that Fiona brought up in, um, in her experiences, um, I think, fit very nicely with some of the things that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, so it was great to hear um, uh, some of the messages that around the, how she has experienced uh, working with her general practice and primary care team. So to begin with, I, I want to just start with a few just uh, important facts and figures just to put into context um, uh, uh, some of the things that I'll then be going on to talk about. Uh, I want to then discuss some of the common problems experienced by blood cancer survivors, uh, the role of the GP in the care of, of people living with blood cancer and uh, developing new models of, of shared care where there's a more explicit role of the general practice team. Um, and then finally, some um, uh, issues around that, things that you might want to try and cover in a visit with any doctor um, uh, to ensure that you get the most out of those visits. So first, just some, uh, some core facts and figures. Uh, it's a sad fact that 53 people in Australia every day will be diagnosed with a blood cancer. Advances in treatment mean that many people are now living long term with, with a blood cancer. And so it's estimated there are now 135,000 Australians uh, living with a blood cancer or related disorder. It's sometimes hard to imagine what that actually means, these numbers. This, um, uh, many of you may recognise, is the MCG on grand final day. This is just about 100,000 people. So there's more than a whole MCG's worth of Australians currently living with a blood cancer or related disorder. The number of people with, living with blood cancer is also projected to continue to grow. Uh, this is from one of the Leukaemia Foundation reports uh, that is sort of projecting uh, the numbers of people living with the different types of blood cancer uh, and expected numbers through to 2035. Uh, there are a few reasons for why we're seeing this growth in numbers. One, as I said, is about improvements in treatment. And so people are living long term after, after their diagnosis and treatment. The second is that we're just growing as a population in Australia. And the third is that we're, as a population, we're living longer. And some of these blood cancers become more common as you get older. 
And particularly just to highlight some of these, the ones in orange, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and in black, uh, myeloma are just two examples of blood cancers that are more common in people as we get, as we get older. So um, that's uh, really the sort of explanation for why these numbers are projected to be that way. So that means by 2035, there'll be nearly three MCGs of, full of people living with a blood cancer or related disorder. So this is really important to think about how do we best provide ongoing care for all these people. So I wanted now to move on to think about uh, some of the problems that people face uh, living with um, a blood cancer. Now this um, infographic is taken from a Lancet series that I was involved in uh, that was recently published around cancer survivorship. The, the reason for putting it up, this is kind of a really clinical view of the pay, of problems that, um, that doctors think about when they see a cancer survivor. This is uh, actually taken from a graphic to do with um, child and adolescent cancer survivors, but it's relevant, I think, to many uh, survivors of blood cancers. The point about it is, it, as I say, it focuses on different organ systems um, and it's a very clinical perspective. It makes doctors just think about, well, which of the different organs um, that could be affected by the, the treatments uh, that somebody has had. Um, it thinks about subsequent cancers that a person is, um, is at risk of. Um, it does fortunately recognize psychological challenges um, but as I say, this is unfortunately the way doctors um, sometimes think about the problems that they need to cover when they see somebody uh, um, uh, uh, living with blood cancer. But actually, if you ask patients what are the things that really matter to them and what are the issues that they're facing on a day-to-day -day basis, you get a very different view. So these are the common things that people will say are big challenges for them on a day-to-day -day basis. This is... Um, this is not just people living with blood cancer, this is common to many cancer survivors. So mental health is a big issue. Anxiety, depression, worry about the cancer recurring, challenges with sleep and fatigue, and as I said, Fiona mentioned, fatigue was a major challenge for her. Common um, issues of just performing your everyday um, activities, uh, issues associated with pain, arising from the cancer treatments, and then just the broader impacts of being able to complete your, those normal activities of daily living, impacts on the ability to work and subsequent consequences on, on your financial uh, situation, another major issue for many cancer survivors. And then you're having to deal with what is quite a complex healthcare system in this country, having to navigate through uh, different um, uh, hospital, primary care systems, and particularly, again, as, as Fiona highlighted, this issue of how you access additional allied health services to provide you that broader holistic care to meet some of these important uh, needs. One of the challenges, because of this very sort of medical perspective that um, often um, affects uh, the way that people think around the, the issues that need to be covered in a consultation when you uh, see somebody um, uh, in a clinic is that the consultation focuses just on these very clinical topics. It focuses on the tests that need to be ordered about looking for signs of recurrence or, or relapse or looking for signs of the late effects of treatment. And so there's this mismatch between actually what the issues that may be really affecting the, that individual patient and survivor on their day-to-day -day experience with the sort of content that is the focus from a doctor's point of view. Um, this is the Victorian Comprehensive Cancer Centre where my team is based. It's where the Kusumac Cancer Centre uh, is located. Um, one of the challenges facing all cancer services at the moment is a, a growing number of people with new diagnoses of cancer, and this includes blood cancers. Um, this has been particularly impacted by COVID. Uh, there was actually um, uh, um, a reduction in, in new diagnoses of cancer during COVID. 
And we're now seeing those patients starting to appear in the healthcare system as we've come out of uh, lockdowns and the broader impacts of the way people consulted during COVID. So cancer services are now facing increases in, in patients with newly diagnosed cancers, and that's having significant impacts on the ability to meet those needs, plus also to provide good follow-up services for the people uh, who have completed their treatment. So that's part of the strain. The other, as I said, is that our current models of care for cancer survivors are imperfect, partly because of this strain that the, the length of the consultation is relatively short and tends to focus on issues of recurrence and monitoring for late effects of treatment. So I work closely with the um, Australian Cancer Survivorship Centre led by Michael Jefford at the Peter Mac. Um, and, uh, um, and we've together been working with them to develop new models of care for cancer survivors, recognising that there is often this mismatch between the needs of cancer survivors and uh, the current models of clinical care provided through hospital models of cancer survivorship follow-up. One of these models is what's called shared care for cancer survivors. So these are uh, quite structured models where there are very explicit recognition um, of the broader healthcare teams, both within hospitals and outside of hospitals, and particularly within general practice and the broader uh, primary care services in the community. And so these are structured models of care where some of the um, traditional visits that uh, would have occurred in a hospital setting are replaced by follow-up visits in the general practice setting. Um, and, uh, and then also explicitly brings in other allied healthcare services within the community with the aim of making these more accessible and to be um, targeting a broader holistic model of care. Uh, so to try and um, meet some of those unmet needs that cancer survivors experience. Before I go on, again, I just wanted to reflect again on these numbers. So 135,000 Australians living with blood cancer and other related uh, disorders. There are about 38,000 GPs in Australia, about 30,000 full-time equivalents. So that means an average GP will care for between three or four patients living with a blood cancer. Now, some people will use this as an argument for why general practice has no role at all in managing patients and survivors of blood cancer, because how can they possibly know enough um, in the care of patients with blood cancers if they only have three or pe people with this condition? But I think that fails to recognise actually a lot of the broader skills that uh, exist in the general practice team and that uh, we've been thinking about how we... Um, uh, design models of shared care that meet this challenge that an individual GP will only have a small number of people who have these uh, particular issues. But how do we design uh, models of care that actually support the GP and the general practice team to provide good structured care? And so these are the sort of key ingredients that we have worked uh, through in the design and testing of these models of shared care. Uh, these icons are meant to represent these key ingredients, and I'll just talk through them first. The, the first is actually having very clear summaries of uh, the treatment that somebody has received. Um, uh, often, increasingly, these are being called survivorship care plans, so they're more than a treatment summary. They actually provide broader summary of, uh, of some of the specific uh, uh, issues that that individual person is experiencing to what their current survivorship care needs are. Uh, they will often uh, summarize the, the types of treatment effects that other clinicians need to be aware of. So what are the latest effects that you need to think about? Um, and then there's this overlap between that survivorship care plan and the next icon, which is around clinical guidelines. So what are the recommended ways to manage these particular late effects or side effects of treatment? Um, so again, to bridge that knowledge gap, but in a very structured way that actually is tailored to that individual patient. So that's part of the way that we bridge that knowledge gap is through having survivorship care plans 
with very clear guidance to the individual general practitioner about managing those common side effects, about what are the recommended surveillance tests and tests that may be required to look for late effects. The third is around very clear roles and responsibilities of the different members of the shared care team. So what is it that the oncology team will do, be doing? When will they be reviewing the patient? When is the general practice team meant to be reviewing the patient in this structured model of follow-up? Who's going to be ordering the surveillance tests? Who's going to be ordering other tests? And how do we ensure that those communication channels are maintained? And then the fourth, and again, this is a really key is, is, um, aspect in terms of ensuring that these are safe models, is having very clear, rapid access back to the cancer centre if there are particular concerns that require that specialist input. So these are models of shared care that we have developed for a number of common cancers. Um, and these are, as, as I say, the absolutely fundamental ingredients to make these effective. We've tested these in a number of trials for, for, as I say, for common cancers such as breast, prostate and colorectal. Uh, we're involved in a number of trials now of further developing these models for less common cancers. I'm not aware uh, um, of any that are currently occurring for specific, with a specific focus around blood cancers, um, but these are transferable models. Uh, they do require oncologists to want to really help lead in the development of them. But we do now know what are the key ingredients to make these safe and effective. We know from our trials of these models that they're often preferred by many patients to their standard hospital follow-up once they've actually experienced them, once they've recognized that these are safe, they're more accessible, and that they recognize that their GP with the adequate support from the cancer center actually does uh, have an important role. Importantly, again, in our studies, we've shown that the vast majority of GPs are prepared to take on this role. Uh, but again, with that caveat, that they feel adequately supported with very good communication from the uh, hospital setting. Finally, this is also starting to be recognized in policy. So a number of state and federal cancer plans are now recommending that we move increasingly to these models of shared care to provide a more holistic model and a more sustainable model uh, for cancer survivors. So I wanted now just to talk a bit more broadly, even if you don't have these structured models of shared care, many cancer survivors will still be having regular visits with their GP as well as their hospital doctors. And so what are the things that you want to do to try and get the most from those consultations? What are the things that you might want to ensure get covered? So again, this is another infographic from the Lancet series. It, of course, this was written for clinicians, uh, but for clinicians who are not cancer specialists. And again, it's trying to highlight that there are actually many areas that non-cancer specialists uh, um, can actually uh, provide important care for cancer survivors. And these are, and there are a number of sort of core areas that you need to think about that you should cover in a good consultation with a cancer survivor. While I'm reflecting this is obviously was written for clinicians, it's equally important for consumers and patients to think about these things because it kind of takes two to tango in a consultation. If, if the patient is driving the agenda for the things that they actually want to cover, then uh, that actually really is very helpful, to, both from a practitioner point of view, but obviously from the perspective of the cancer survivor, to ensure that they get the most of it out of that consultation. So these are kind of like the standard bits that get covered usually very well. So the first is obviously uh, reviewing the treatment summary or ideally if a survivorship care plan exists, reviewing that. Um, just as a reminder of the details of that individual person's uh, cancer, the treatments that they've had, and the sorts of uh, side effects and late effects that they might be experiencing on the basis of the treatments they've received. 
I put family history in there. Again, this is a broad issue for cancer survivors, but it's important to recognize that uh, um, um, uh, of updating anybody's family history of cancer. Sometimes there are these uh, rare inherited cancer syndromes, and it's important if you have to have significant changes in your family history of new, of new relatives who've been diagnosed with a cancer of mentioning this as part of your follow-up consultation. The second is reviewing tests that may be due. These may be uh, tests for late effects of treatment. They may be tests to ensure that there are no signs of recurrence or remission. And again, being clear about who's meant to be ordering them, when they're due, and who will be reviewing the results. As I said, these are the sorts of areas that tend to get focused in a very traditional oncology follow-up. However, there's actually a lot more to cover. And these are areas that actually your general practice team are very familiar with. So the first is those broader physical and psychosocial aspects and consequences of having had a cancer. Clearly, it's important if you're experiencing pain to bring this up, to talk about the current pain management strategies that you'll be having and, and the severity of pain and to talk about different ways that that pain may be managed. Fatigue and sleep, again, very important to, to bring these up if, if, if it's a significant issue. Mental health problems, as I said, again, um, uh, important to raise if you're having particular issues of, with mood or worries about uh, recurrence. Um, sex and intimacy, again, often a neglected issue that can be very important. And it's in, uh, from a clinician point of view, it's important to allow people to raise these issues in a sensitive way and, and explore any specific challenges that um, a, an individual person and their partner may be experiencing. And then as again, the impact that, um, the, um, that the cancer and uh, subsequent treatments may be having on ability to work and impacts on finances. Then of course, there's the broader um, lifestyle factors that are actually really important for overall health and well-being, um, but also increasingly recognized for many cancers that um, maintaining a healthy lifestyle in terms of obviously not smoking, maintaining good levels of physical activity within your capacity to do that, maintaining a healthy diet and sensible or healthy levels of alcohol. These are all really important issues that um, to talk through with a doctor, just to um, review if there are areas that you want to work on to improve um, your overall well-being through these uh, important lifestyle factors. And again, obviously, we've got very used to, in the last two years to be thinking about COVID vaccination, but vaccinations in general for cancer survivors and particularly blood cancers are an important, a really important aspect. Um, of ensuring which of the, the vaccines that they really need to be up to date with, which are the safe ones that they can have and so on. And then other cancer screening tests and other screening tests that um, a person may be due on the basis of their age. And then finally, um, other medical conditions. Uh, many cancer survivors will have other chronic long-term uh, medical conditions that also need to be reviewed by their GP, whether this is high blood pressure, diabetes, how that may interact with other treatments that they're on for their cancer and so on. Uh, these are uh, important aspects that sometimes can get neglected. So I know this sounds like an awful lot to cover in a consultation. Sometimes it's actually important to try and work out which of the things that you want to cover in that consultation. There are um, tools that uh, uh, some cancer centers are now using uh, called the distress thermometer, uh, it's actually not just a distress thermometer, it's that, that's part of it, which is a way of screening for um, uh, anxiety and depression. There's also a checklist as part of that, which allows people to identify the specific problems that, are, that they want to talk about in that particular consultation. But again, you may want to think about, uh, if, without using such a tool, uh, just think about, well, these are the things that I actually are really bothering me now. These are the things I want to make the most of in that particular consultation today. Um, and if there are other things that I need to cover, then I'll arrange to make a separate visit to follow up with those. Then finally, again, Fiona mentioned um, 
the importance of, um, of uh, um, access to allied healthcare services and uh, your general practitioner can help you um, gain access to this through various Medicare funded schemes. And in particular, there are these two um, parts of Medicare billing items called GP management plans and team care arrangements, which allow you to access a range of different allied healthcare services funded through Medicare. These are um, the, some, just some of the core different types of allied health care services that can be um, funded through these team care arrangements and management plans. Um, there are unfortunately limits to the number of services that can be provided in a calendar year. So essentially five services across the range of dietetics, exercise, physiology, physio, OT and podiatry, but an additional five psychology visits as well uh, for uh, through a mental health care plan. Uh, so this, this is a really important aspect of, of discussing with your GP, um, again, exploring what are those specific broader areas that um, where these additional allied health services might be helpful. I'm conscious uh, there's been an awful lot in the media over the last uh, few months around growing concerns of GP shortages, particularly in rural areas, but actually across the whole of Australia. Uh, some of the media actually is around future concerns of a GP shortage because um, we're not getting enough medical graduates choosing to go into general practice. So only 16% of medical graduates are now choosing to go into general practice when we actually need about 40%. So there is a longer term concern about um, GP shortages, but also there is an acute shortage, in, particularly in some rural areas. Uh, and so this can be a, a, an additional challenge of finding a GP. That said, it is really important, as Fiona again highlighted, having an established long term relationship with a GP is, is really critical. Um, uh, partly so that you start to build that longer term relationship so that they get to know you and uh, and you actually feel comfortable to talk about some of these potentially more sensitive areas. Um, and uh, and that continuous relationship is the ideal preferred model, although recognising it's not always possible to achieve, but, but, but try and work on that uh, as if you can, because that is the, you know, that is the ideal model to work with a, a GP and to, to develop that longer term continuous relationship. However, I think it's more, it is broader than that. If you can't reach that, by at least identifying a single practice where you can ensure that all the medical records and correspondence with your cancer services are going to that practice so that they are in a single place in your medical record, ensuring that the hospital has the right doctor and the right practice so that those letters are going back to that practice team so that you have at least a continuous medical record in general practice so that they can access those care plans or treatment plans if they've been sent by the hospital service. They know who to contact um, if needed uh, as well. So increasingly, we want to be moving towards this recognition that the general practice is part of a can if your cancer care team. They have a lot to offer, and particularly as we move more towards these shared care models of, uh, where general practice is a key part of your cancer team. Thank you very much. Thank you, John, for that, um, that wonderful comprehensive pres presentation. If, we, if you could step into cloning, I'm sure we could look at um, <laughs> embracing an opportunity to pop you all around the country, just several of you in those GP areas. <laughs> no, I did love your presentation and lovely holistic approach looking at um, that medical perspective, that clinical process versus that patient perspective and what the patient needs and um, certainly really valuing that um, those models of shared care so that we can step into that more holistic and sustainable model of support and care to patients. So um, I really value that the time that you've spent here today is very clear and concise and, and very valuable. So thank you very much. Turning now, to, um, turning now to some of the unique challenges faced by rural and remote people in blood cancer, I would like to introduce Ron Middleton. 
Ron works at the Cancer Care Services in the Toowoomba Hospital as a Haematology Cancer Care Coordinated Clinical Nurse Consultant. Ron has devoted his career to nursing and has been immersed in haematology and oncology for greater than 30 years. He started his career at the Royal Brisbane Women's Hospital, a major haematology and allogeneic stem cell transplant centre for, Queen, for Queensland for 25 years. Ron's knowledge and expertise in this area is extensive and his commitment to our blood cancer patients has been shown in his dedication over many years. So thank you, Ron. I'll hand it over to you. As Marianne said, I've been sort of working in haematology now for 35 years, coming up 36. And my original time was at Royal Brisbane, major tertiary centre uh, for 25 years. And probably moving to Toowoomba 10 years ago has really opened my eyes to the need of regional and rural people. So that, there has been that change in perspective. Uh, just... Okay, so... Um, Talking about cancer care coordinators and the role of cancer care coordinator can differ depending on the physical setting. So once again, a major metropolitan hospital versus a regional hospital versus somebody out more rural. And so we have some very good care coordinators out at Charleville, which is uh, about six hours drive from us up in Longreach. And what they do is probably different to what I do because they do more general stuff. As we say, you know, certainly the difference between tertiary and community is, is is very different in that sense. The issue being is the roles being formed may differ, one, between the health settings, two, between the hospitals and definitely between the different states. So in, in that sense, um, this talk really is, is general and it's gonna be sometimes very hard to get specific information because it all depends on where the service has been provided. Also within the hospital, is it, um, you know, a general haematology um, care coordinator role, or is it very disease specific, like you get in some of the bigger tertiary centres? So we have a one FTE full-time equivalent here at Toowoomba Hospital, so I cover all haematology, including some non-malignant stuff. Whereas bigger centres in Brisbane have specific leukaemia uh, care coordinators, myeloma care coordinators, MDS care coordinators. So once again, depending on where you're being treated, there will be different arrangements and, and setups. Um, and also, you know, the transplant things, whether it be autologous or algenaic on, on top of that. Um, so the cancer care coordinator can be a really good resource for identifying local resources. Um, so, and especially, and as uh, Professor Emery was saying, is that if you're in a more rural area, there may not be the specific resources there, but there could be other resources you can tap into to help you um, with your, not necessarily with your diagnosis, but you know, coming to terms with stuff, whether that be through group exercise, other allied health positions and stuff like that. There is a, a role looking at some nurse-led uh, clinics, um, one because of pressures in the hospitals. So one of the things is myelosplastic syndrome, is that yes, they might see a hematologist once every six months, uh, but necessarily clinic might sort of support their transfusion requirements as required on a you know two, four, six weekly basis and stuff like that. Certainly in myeloma, there's been a lot more nurse-led clinics where through cycle one of their treatment, they would see the consultant and then from cycle two onwards, they'd see the consultant on the first day and then nurse reviews. That's certainly happening with us here at Toowoomba Hospital. We've set up a uh, home chemotherapy program uh, where they first month is they're, they're trained when they see the consultants by the nurses. Then um, they see the consultant day one of each cycle thereafter. And then the nurse will do a telephone link. They take their chemotherapy home with them if they are being um, assessed as being uh, appropriate. And then they take their chemotherapy home and when the chemotherapy is due, the nurse will give them a call on that day um, to assess everything, how they're going. Whether um, the um, specialist nurses can do more procedural things in hospitals, I certainly know in Townsville Hospital, one of the nurses, um, the nurse um, practitioner up there actually does um, some of the bone marrows and stuff like that. So there is this wider scoping um, but is that something like Professor Emery said is the, you know, the, the hospitals are struggling sometimes to attract staff, um, GPs, but also 
some of the hospitals with the regional areas attracting staff. And also, um, especially for the transplant patients, um, they have more specialised post-transplant clinics um, by nurse practitioners and the nurse coordinators down there, which I think can be um, very helpful and helps provide resources for patients as well. Um, as I said, in the Australian context, there is a lot of um, support for nurses per se, Cancer Nursing Australia, Clinical Oncology Society of Australia, the Haematology Society of Australia New Zealand, as we go the link, the Chemia Foundation is a great support where I can get information from. Uh, Lymphoma Australia, Myeloma Australia, Myeloproliferative Neoplasms Alliance Australia, which is not a very well-known organisation, but they're there. And there's also the group of rare cancers. Um, and my concern is, is most hematology cancers are a, red can a rare cancer. So the, to me, the Leukemia Foundation covering all blood cancers um, makes, um, uh, to me, a, a good resource. And also many, many moons ago, when I first started in um, hematology back in 1987, uh, we had very close links with the Leukemia Foundation at the Royal Brisbane Hospital. And you know, we've built those over the years, which I think has been good. Um, so what's on offer for people? And I think with the Leukemia Foundation, obviously written information and booklets, uh, which are really important uh, for patients. And the um, and also like say education meetings like now with that, but there's also some of the other practical support such as emotional and counselling and stuff like that, um, financial assistance. And I know sometimes you got to do the budget and stuff before you submit it, but you know that's why we're here and it's also social work. As mentioned uh, previously by Fiona, accommodation and transport are really big issues for regional rural. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit in a sec. Um, grief counselling and, and advocacy. And certainly um, I've referred a couple of patients recently who want to return to work. And so I referred to the Leukemia Foundation to try and get sort of exercise physiology to get a plan for them. So how they can return to work in their best physical condition. So there's a lot there. We certainly use the Cancer Council here in Toowoomba because they actually have accommodation in Toowoomba. But uh, Leukemia Foundation, you know, has got a lot of accommodation in Brisbane, Rocky and Townsville and Cairns. So you've got to know your local area, what's in your local area that you can use and how do we diversify that? One of the other things about the Cancer Council here in Queensland is they have a wig library. Um, hair loss is not such a big issue what it used to be 20 years ago, but it's still a very important issue for a lot of people. And I think sometimes we overlook that a little bit. So I think the other issue and um, Professor Emery mentioned about, you know, What's Medicare got to offer? Social services, Centrelink, support for carers, Commonwealth respite. These are all things that, you know, certainly um, the Leukemia Foundation social work can help link some of those more social issues, which can be long-term and also can be acute sometimes. There's an organization called Look Good, Feel Better, um, which is Australia-wide and they hold workshops in different hospitals. And um, about three years ago, they started to include men in their workshops so men can go and get whatever they want done. Uh, we certainly had them come to the Royal Brisbane Hospital, which was great. The YWCA has an encore program, which is money for breast cancer patients. But I can't see there's a reason why people can't be initiative and say, you know, look, I've had cancer. Can I join some of these groups? Uh, canteen's really, you know, very important for our teenagers and siblings but also children of adults being treated. So they've expanded their horizons as well. There's other ones like Mummy's Wish, Red Kite. Um, the state government's been advertising health, healthy living programs here in Queensland. Even the local Toowoomba region has a healthy program where they put out a six monthly calendar so people can be involved in community issues. And that can be an issue about, you know, how do you reestablish some of those social contacts? And you, know, you can obviously take friends or family with you. So it also helps to break down some of those barriers as well. There's a couple of interesting ones I found called Golden Octopus Foundation. Um, and they're that specific looking at childhood cancers. Um, I don't know if they're Australia wide yet, but they're certainly in Queensland. And there's a very local group about two hours north of Toowoomba called Birds of a Feather. And that's women with cancer, not just breast cancer, but they provide support groups within their community. So I think these days with being able to search and and look on the internet and stuff, I think it's really important to look at what's available locally 
um, that, and, and hopefully the care coordinators are aware of it. And if not, you can educate us. Um, so I, as I say, knowing your local area, I think is really important, but also the region and the state, because what's available is different state by state. So in Queensland, transport is 50 kilometres from your nearest hospital. New South Sid, uh, sorry, Victoria, it's 100 kilometres. So there's different sort of um, guidelines. So it's really important and it's really important to ask as Professor Zembri was saying. And where is your treatment centre? So in Toowoomba, we're actually the only start, fully staffed unit away from the coast. So, you know, we've got places, Gold Coast, Brisbane, Sunshine Coast, um, Rocky, Townsville, but we're actually only inland staffed centre. And so, you know, makes us a little bit unique to what we do here and, and stuff like that. Our treatment centres um, done by visiting uh, physicians or hematologists and do allied health come to those or they use local allied health in those centres. Um, where are the clinics being held? Are, those, are they a dedicated uh, centre or is it sort of a, an outpatient centre that gets changed from day to day? So I certainly know one of the hospital has an infusion center on Thursdays and Fridays, on Wednesdays, the flying doctors come in to do surgery. So that can be multi-use things in, in that sense. As Professor Emery said, what supports are available locally? How do we tap in to the allied health and stuff like that? Um, and is there other specialty um, um, medical specialties available, such as renal, cardiology, infectious diseases, or can some of that be done by telehealth or does that also require travel um, to a more specialist centre uh, with that. One of the big issues we have in haematology is requirements for radiology of PET scans, uh, MRI scans, CT scans. So in Toowoomba, the PET scan here is in a private hospital. Um, before that, that was only been here about four years. Before that, everyone had to travel to Brisbane. Um, we now have an MRI at Toowoomba Hospital about three years ago. So um, and these are very expensive pieces of machinery. So once again, what's available, what, what is needed, um, and there's something else closer to home um, that can be used. So not wanting to dwell on Queensland per se, but you know, quite a big area, multiple health districts. And so what happens between districts can be different. So Toowoomba's here, the Darling Downs, we're only 150 kilometers from Brisbane, but um, the, the photo of Toowoomba, Toowoomba sits on top of the Great Dividing Range. So as well as physical barrier, there's actually these psychological emotional barriers because a lot of patients don't like going down the hill to the valley to head towards Brisbane. Um, and so there's a, it's not just the physical stuff in that sense. The other issue is Twimba is expected to double its size in the next 15 years. So we've got all that growth and development and how we're going to do that with it. This is just our local health district and so um, from uh, Toowoomba to Taroom is 470 kilometres um, just in our health district in that sense. So once again, knowing your local area, what's available for outreach. We actually go all the way out to Quilpe and, and Thargaminda. So you know, nearly 900 kilometres patients have to travel. So as what was said previously, what can be done a bit more locally? Do people have to travel? I think in that sense, COVID's been a blessing, but it's also been a devil in disguise. Um, we, we have looked at what we can do, but sometimes things can't be done and they have to come to a more larger centre. So with COVID, um, there was no transport from the New South Wales border to Toowoomba during COVID. The buses stopped running. The buses from um, Charleville to Toowoomba ran twice a week. and we still do not today have any transport, north of public transport north of Toowoomba. So Kingaroy Hospital, which is two hours north of us, has a bus that comes each day, but really we, got a, we only have a three hour window period to treat the patients before the bus goes back to Kingaroy. So these are some of the local logistics uh, that happen here, but I'm sure would happen elsewhere as well. So transport, accommodation are massive. Um, so we treat most hematology patients, except for some of the younger acute leukemias will go to Brisbane. Um, but at the same time, that can couple of days waiting for a bed to become available in Brisbane. So it's really important these patients are educated 
and supported uh, during this time. What are going to be the accommodation options? So my first port of call is ring the Leukemia Foundation. So I've got a new patient coming to Brisbane. We're not sure what hospital they're going to yet. So at least they got their heads up and they're aware of what's happening. It's also good that the Leukemia Foundation speak to the individual patient or family. And so in that sense, we're not going through a third person. Really important about discussing the diagnosis, written information, current and future plans, but really important to include the, the uh, carers and the family and the friends who's gonna be supporting the patient uh, so that they're aware. And sometimes when you're stressed, not everybody hears all the information. So that's really part of my, my role with that. Um, assessments of activity of daily living. To me, social supports is a critical one because if they're out of town, how are they going to get here? Who's going to bring them? Who's going to look after them when they're at home? And um, Fiona was, talked a few things about that with her personally. Um, but if somebody lives alone, um, people are moved away from the smaller communities to get work. Who's there to support them and stuff? So to me, social support is one of the first things I actually look at um, when somebody comes in. Learning ability and health literacy is a massive thing coming in now because, you know, uh, in our health district, 42% of people uh, are considered to be low socioeconomic group. Um, so we know that health literacy is not as good there. And out of that, a third of those people are considered to be severely socioeconomic deprived. So once again, this is some really critical issues. I put mental health there. COVID's probably lifted the lid a little bit on mental health, but as people know with our lymphoma treatments and myeloma treatments, time you add the bit of steroids in as part of the treatment protocols, if someone does have an anxiety issue or a mental health issue, this sort of doesn't help them. So I think it's really, really, really important we get um, supports in there for people, for everybody, but especially if they've had a history of anxiety and mental health with psychology and stuff so that we can give them the treatment appropriately and safely and that uh, we can keep them on track as much as possible. Um, I do a lot of liaison with tertiary centres. So at the moment, I have three patients being worked off for allogeneic transplant at the Royal Brisbane, and I have six patients being referred to the Princess Alexandra for autologous transplants. So that's a lot of work. And the Kimmy Foundation um, provide great support um, doing that. So. Also referring to other specialties. Um, I think rural centres is really, as Professor Emery is really important. I think um, the issue being though, is not all centres can do all treatments. So it's really important. We know what's available out there. Patients know what's available out there. We tried to organise blood transfusions about three hours south of Toowoomba, uh, but twice, one, the courier dropped the blood off later in the day and the, um, they didn't have the storage facility. So that was two bags of blood wasted, which is $500 a bag. So, um, and the other time the uh, patient wasn't aware that the blood had arrived, so he didn't turn up at the hospital. So um, we do try to do things. We do use some of our more regional hospitals to help with, let's say, transfusions, accessing portacasts and pick lines. Um, and the other issue, part of my role is allied health professionals and how do we use those and very appropriately. And my, my go-to line is, is I refer to allied health, so that might me look good. So whether that be dietitian, psychology, physio, um, I think um, we get caught up on the medical side of things and we forget about those normal activities of living, how they're going to progress. And that's part of the key coordinator is to look at that stuff up front, do those assessments to see um, what's gonna be needed when they get discharged and go home. Um, as I say, um, diagnosis is really important, planned treatments. So <clears throat> I really um, reinforce with the patients after they've been spoken to by the medical staff on do you understand what your treatment is? And so, and this is really important for patients you know uh, are, are going to be, you know, especially myeloma patients less than 70, um, that, you know, they're usually um, referred for stem cell transplant. So it's not about we're going to treat you like this for the next couple of months, but what's going to be happening down the track for you so they can get the bigger picture and start planning for stuff. Um, because I think that's really important. Oh, you didn't tell me about that. No. We, so I think it's really important that we get this big picture, focus on what's important today, but these are also issues we need to think about uh, down the track. 
Um, as I said, social situation support, absolutely critical. Because um, what I say is nursing medical staff, we do 50% of the work. The family and carers do 50% of the work as well. It, because they, go, they monitor them when they go home, bring them in for their appointments, make sure they take the medications. Yes, we do stuff in the hospital, but they need that support when they're at home as well. Um, because as Professor Henry said, when you're tired and fatigued, your memory's not thinking as well. You may not remember to take your tablets in the morning. So, you know, family and friends are absolutely critical. We've mentioned about referral, going back to country hospitals, maintenance treatments is really important. So we do a lot of telehealth. Um, we have about 20 telehealth appointments on a Wednesday. So people that are on maintenance oral treatment, we might see them once every three or four months in Toowoomba and the rest of every other month is teleconference um, out in their hometown. I think survivorship is, is, is really important, but something we probably don't focus on as much as what we should, because we tend to focus on the acute issues and getting them through some of the early illnesses. And I think that survivorship is really important. I've actually had a patient request a survivorship plan uh, a couple of months ago, um, for, and we've had another couple of patients wanting to return to work so I think that is, is something we need to develop even better. <clears throat> but as Professor Henry says, doing their routine assessments, like, you know, if you've got a cardiac history, make sure you see the cardiologist. You know, doing your mammograms if you're in the age group and, and stuff like that. Doing your prostate if, if you're in the age group and if you've got bowel changes, do your stuff. So I think all that sort of stuff is, is actually really important. I suppose as a cancer care coordinator, I can't fix everybody's problems. And um, that's why my allied health team are so critical to help meeting patients' needs. Also then Leukemia Foundation um, as, as well for that. So I think, as I say, we're part of a team, whether it be nursing, the admin staff at the hospital here, physiotherapy. Um, so at the moment, I've got a patient who's been worked up for transplant. He's had a brain injury in the past. So I'm looking after him per se. I have the nurse navigator from his health district. Um, I have the Aboriginal liaison. Um, I have the um, Oliver McMahon, which is the Cancer Council Lodge here where he's staying. Um, I have the PTS officer at his local hospital. I have social work involved and I have psychology involved. And because of the brain injury, he just struggles to process stuff. But we've got him through his six cycles of chemo and he's about to get him mobilized for his stem cells. So things can be done if we've got the right supports in place for these patients. As I mentioned, transport and accommodation are really pretty critical issues. And certainly patients being referred for transplant, the Leukemia Foundation has just um, been excellent in supporting patients, which is really good. And one of the things is like people get flown into Toowoomba, but then they get concerned, oh, how do I get home again? So, you know, the flying doctors can run clinics out in the, uh, some of the rural settings but they also then help with transporting patients uh, to get patients home. So they're probably a service that's not quite recognised. Uh, so I did a lot of referral to tertiary centres, but we, I've talked about that a bit. So um, to me, important to be patient focused. So all patients and the circumstances are different, even though they may have the same diagnosis. So it's really important I don't put patients in the same basket. We really got to look at what the patients need. Support of family and friends as I, is important as what we are for treating. Providing the adequate information. And I think we've got to be careful not to overload patients. Sometimes we give them all this information and they never, take, they never read anything. So it's about doing things in small bits that they can understand. Uh, comprehensive assessment. So we make sure we get the right supports in place for them. And, and, you know, I'm part of a large team in that sense. So I do rely on the team to help a lot. Also, it's really important um, to be able to take the initiative and lead as a care coordinator, but also it's important sometimes I stay back and allow others who might have a better, you know, rep not everyone has to have a good rapport with me. If they've got a good rapport with another staff member, let that staff member, you know, take some of the initiative and, you know, and that I think that's really important. Um, just developing really good networks. I really think it's critical important that we, patients maintain their independence and we don't make them dependent on the system. So we've got to get that balance with that. And once again, be patient focused. I think that's, you know, look at what the patient's needs are.
Professor John Emery and Rod Middleton for sharing your valuable knowledge and time with us today. Um, some questions that have been put through um, prior to this presentation, um, I'd just like to address them, some to John and some to Ron, so forgive me. Um, John, I wanted to ask, um, you know, we've heard a bit about what information we should ask to get the most out of our GP consultations. I wonder what sort of questions should we be asking in developing a care plan and who should you talk to if you feel that your cancer may have returned? Sure, yeah. Uh, so I think um, the first point of call to talk about getting a care plan developed is um, uh, either your oncologist or if there is a, a cancer nurse coordinator, then uh, they're the people who probably need to help develop that care plan with you. Um, to begin with, in terms of getting the right information shared that you can then share with other members of your treatment team, including your general practice team. Um, that, that we think this is a really important um, part of that communication to other members of the healthcare team to sort of highlight um, the things that as a GP you need to, to be thinking about. Um, uh, from, a, from the specifics of the treatment, but then also those those broader survivorship needs. So uh, there, are, I, there are one of the problems with using the term care plan is that there are also care plans used in the context of general practice care plans. And so that was some of the um, mention around care plans in the context of access to allied health and mental health services as well. We talk about care plans in that setting too. So there are Medicare care plans. And, um, and so obviously if you're looking to um, think, if you want to access to a dietitian or physiotherapy or exercise physiology, talk to your GP about a care plan to help support access to those um, Medicare funded services. There was a second part to your question there, Megan, I think, wasn't there? <laughs> there was, sorry. Um, so sorry, John, the, the last part of the question was, um, who mm. should we talk to if somebody feels that their cancer may have returned? Mm, sure. Um, I, I actually think um, going to your GP to begin with, because they're often the most accessible, um, and they, they'll be able to, uh, if need be, order some initial tests quickly. They'll also be able to liaise with your oncology team as well um, and that's again that's part of this really important model of, of ensuring that there's a really clear rapid access route if there are concerns around recurrence but often it's it's easier to go to your GP they're more accessible but obviously th there should be links to cancer nurse coordinators as well um, and so that is an alternative route particularly if you're having problems getting into a GP because of problems of GP access so there are a couple of alternative routes, but I think, you know, uh, ideally um, the GP team can often deal with some of those initial concerns around recurrence. They know who to uh, bring in if they need specialist input, and they can often order some of those initial tests quite quickly if you need them. Um, and often they'll be able to uh, reassure you that actually it isn't a, a sign of recurrence and it may be something else. Um, the the the, um, the the other important point about this is obviously you don't want to wait until your next planned visit necessarily, which might be a few months away. And so um, and often you know those early symptoms that may be due to a recurrence will occur in between those planned visits. And so actually going to talk to your GP uh, is a much quicker route to actually get some input into getting some initial tests done. Beautiful. Thank you so much, John. Appreciate that. Um, and Ron, obviously, we've touched on the, the rural and regional side of things, and we know that digital and telehealth appointments are a really valuable tool in regional and rural settings. How do you know when you do need a physical examination and what sort of options would you suggest? I know you mentioned um, the Royal Flying Doctor Service, obviously, sometimes do clinics and what have you, but um, might it be the nurse on call or visiting your nearest emergency department? What, what options are there? No, very true. And um, that's one of the concerns or one of the issues we have sometimes um, is that we will quite often um, speak to the hospital where the um, video clinic's been done or the GP surgery um, to see that there can be uh, a GP or a nurse 
um, could maybe do some of the like nodal assessments for, for somebody who's a lymphoma patient who's been in remission for two or three years, uh, just to check that the, 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 you know, the nodes are good. But, um, and I think that's the issue Fiona made, is a consistent GP is, and John's much really, really having a, a consistent GP. But yes, we can use the other um, staff members at other hospitals, um, but they also have to be known what we're looking for and what our concerns are. And um, therefore, if the patient has concerns, then we need to be able to relay that what might be a related issue. Beautiful. Thanks, Ron. Um, and so obviously we've talked about the, the role of a cancer care coordinator and thank you for, I guess, explaining the full extent of the types of support they can provide. Who could you go to for the types of support that a cancer care coordinator offers if your regional health service doesn't have one? No, that's a very good question. And um, look, I, and I forgot to put it in my slides, which I'm very remiss, but the, the GPs are such a great resource. But the trouble we're finding in rural Queensland is it's taken patients two or three weeks to get an appointment at their GP. Um, and then there's that lack of allied health in that service. Certainly, like our speech therapists and dietitians do a lot of telehealth, um, more for the head and neck patients, but they will do it for our hematology patients. So I think... Um, Video conferencing is being used more by allied health, um, but it is a real concern. I will speak to the um, GP practice nurse if I have specific concerns, like I have a, a young fella who's having a lot of troubles transporting PTS. So I think, as I said, those networks are dealing directly with the what services are available. I'm a bit lucky. We have a very experienced nurse out at Charville who's worked at Royal Brisbane and Peter Mac. And, and stuff, so, um, and a lot in hematology. So I really rely on those specialist nurses in those other centres, um, even though I want something a bit left field, I'll always ring them as a network to see what they can suggest. Uh, but sometimes it is very limited. And I know one patient had to wait every month for the flying doctors to do their clinic at the remote township he was in. So it, it can be really, really difficult. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Ron. Um, and so, John, people living with a blood cancer are often on novel and emerging therapies. So how do we ensure our medical, uh, I guess, our ongoing medication safety if our GP is unaware of the types of therapies or, or treatment we might be having? Yeah. I think this is a real challenge uh, for GPs, but, but other doctors who are not uh, working directly in, in oncology because there are you know, this growing number of, of new treatments with um, particularly the immunotherapies, but some of the target therapies as well, that have quite novel side effects that are very different to the standard side effects that, that doctors are more familiar with in terms of the chemotherapies and so on. So I, I think, again, this is a, it, it again highlights the importance of very good communication with the primary care team uh, so that they are aware of the, of the specific side effects that they need to be looking for if somebody is on one of these newer agents. Um, and, uh, and particularly, obviously, with some of the immunotherapies, things can escalate quite quickly. And uh, so knowing exactly what are those early signs and symptoms that might be due to um, a side effect to one of these neural therapies and who to contact to actually... Um, decide you know what what's the next step but so again it comes back to that really clear communication providing information that the patient can share with other um, doctors um, particularly obviously if they're living far for some distance from the um, from their treatment center um, uh, and um, so it's about partly around raising awareness of the individual person living with the cancer what what are those important early symptoms that they need to go and consult with? having ideally some written information that they can share with their GP. Um, and again, it's it's part of this these models of share care that we're trying to establish to ensure that the GP has the information they need at that point when they need it and having clear routes of access to the specialist team to consult if, if there are concerns um, so that they can get them seen quickly. If, um, the, the novel... The novel therapies and these novel side effects are just a really good example of 
why we need to develop these models better. Absolutely. So I guess along the same line, how then do we ensure that medical records are being shared effectively between those health yeah. services and with the patient? Yeah. Um, again, it comes back to idea of what we have are these survivorship care plans. Um, unfortunately, you know, we have my health record, but that is not turned out the way we had hoped it would. And, and most clinicians are not really using my health record as a way to share information between different parts of the health service. So it does come back to um, a, a ensuring that a, ideally a patient has a treatment summary. Uh, it was interesting to hear what Fiona said that she'd ended up developing her own. Yeah. Uh, you would hope that they, that you know individuals don't have to do that. That actually the cancer service would be uh, thinking about providing these things. But it, it's interesting that. At the moment, not all services are necessarily um, providing the sorts of level of information that patients want and, and can share with other doctors as they need it. Um, uh, but, you know, I, um, uh, I, you know and again, it, it's about ensuring that your hospital centre knows which general practice to send any correspondence to. And again, that comes back to having a consistent practice as well, so that at least you can try and have as much of your records and the communication between your treating centre and a practice all going into um, the, the same place. But uh, unfortunately, our, it, it, this comes back to some of our, the complexities of our healthcare system that isn't always very well joined up. And it does require often the individual patient to be um, thinking about this, even though, you know, I think unfortunately patients assume that this goes on, that we are well connected and we communicate well. Unfortunately, the reality of it doesn't always work that way. And sometimes you need to just check that they know who to write to, who to be corresponding with and so on. Yeah, beautiful. Thanks, John. Um, Ron, a question we had, um, I, I think, especially with relation to the, the regional and metro side of things, how can we sort of ensure that the latest treatments, you know, whether a patient is in a rural or a regional area versus a metro area, um, is, I guess, you know, that they do have access to that latest, greatest thing, no matter where they're living? Um, and how could they most appropriately advocate for themselves for the treatment to be done locally as opposed to needing to travel a vast distance if that treatment is able to be provided close to home? Yeah, look, there's a couple of issues there and you're correct. Mm. Um, the, the issue is one, the latest and greatest, so we're talking about clinical mm. trials, then yeah. that sometimes can only be done at specific hospitals mm. um, and can't be shared due to technicalities and um, processes and stuff like that. Yeah. We certainly have a very close link with Princess Alexandra and Royal Brisbane Hospital. So if somebody comes in that we will contact them about any clinical trials that they may have available. The other issue is, um, and I haven't looked at it for a little while, but the Leukemia Foundation also had a portal for looking at clinical trials in Australia. So I think, and once again, um, and, and look, there might be things that go on that, that was put on there yesterday that, that we don't know about. So I think um, that proactivity of the patients uh, can be mm. really good. Or, I mean, I've in the past, I've had many patients say, well, they're using this in America, why can't I use it in Australia? So in the sense of it does open our eyes up sometimes that, you know, that, that there might be new things around the corner. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, um, once again, talking to the doctors, especially if they, I know patients talk in the, um, in the waiting rooms and stuff, so if they've heard of something or someone has done some sort of research, um, then they just need to, to talk. I think it's important to talk to us. Is this available? Can I get it here in my local hospital or do I have to travel? I know the Australian government and, and the Kimmy Foundation was part of that, is looking at a, a national sort of teletrial sort of model. Um, I'm not sure how far that's progressed uh, per se, but that's once again, probably gonna be more about what's available in your major tertiary centres and what can be done in the regional rural centres um, from those tertiary centres. So once again, good networking, good communication with, mm. with, with everybody. 
Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Ron. Because I think sometimes people are talking about, I guess, chemotherapy in general, which they're having to travel a great distance for. So not just the clinical trial side of things. Um, so I guess as you're talking about that beautiful networking to, to discuss that and make those challenges clear with your treating team that if you could do it closer to home, if it's able to be done there, um, obviously the benefits it would have for you as an individual would be important. Yeah. And the critical staff is that those centres have the staff that can do that treatment mm. safely. Yeah. And it's that's the issue. And if you look at the, there's a Queensland Rural Remote Chemotherapy um, uh, framework. And mm. part of that is actually like medical supervision and, it, and it's what's come up, Fiona said it before, Professor Maria said, is having that consistent GP or medical staff that can provide that sort of supervision or, or be contactable if there's an issue. Yeah, beautiful. Thanks, Ron. Um, John, last question for you uh, was, I guess, how do we restore confidence in our relationship with a GP where the mm. diagnosis may have been a bit delayed or difficult to identify? Yeah. Look, unfortunately, uh, sometimes patients will experience what they certainly perceive as delays in their diagnosis. Mm. And that can be really damaging uh, for the relationship and the trust. Uh, sometimes, um, uh, you know, individuals may just decide that actually that they have lost so much trust that they actually need to go and find another GP. And that's that's absolutely fine. And But it's then about trying to find a, a new GP that you can engage with and, and build a new relationship with. At, at other times though, you know, if you do want to um, uh, stick with your same GP, then, um, uh, you know, a, a sensitive discussion around uh, what happened before the diagnosis and concerns around, you know, their experience. Now a good GP will be able to handle that discussion and talk through some of those the challenges that um, that they may have experienced in um, in in their diagnostic journey. So it, it, it you know not not all is necessarily lost, but it can become you know a, a, it is a real challenge. Unfortunately, you know blood cancers are uncommon, and an individual GP will probably diagnose a new blood cancer once about every five years. So, and, and they will see a lot of people with symptoms that may be due to a blood cancer. And that's part of the diagnostic challenge. And sometimes why well, it takes some, um, some time to actually make the final diagnosis. And, and that can be a, a major challenge for trust ongoing. But if you, if you do have a well-established relationship and you want to try and rebuild it, then having a sensitive conversation around what happened uh, mm. is is an option absolutely beautiful thank mm. you so much and ron super duper lucky last um the question we have here was around what medical or legal documents would a person need to have in place to specify their medical wishes with regards to treatment and ongoing yeah certainly um people coming in um I think I think it's mandatory in Queensland now, and you know, over seventy-five um, gets to ask about an advanced health directive um, when, when they're admitted, whether they're healthy or well or unwell. But certainly, um, EPOA enduring power of attorney is really critical. But people need to remember there's two parts: that there's the financial part and the health part. Mm -hmm. So, um, and also talking to the family so they know who's responsible for what because there's nothing worse than someone coming in, in you know, unwell state. And, and yes, one person's been directed as being EPOA, but the other person's not necessarily, uh, does want to accept that she's, that that's the person to do it. So I think good family communication. And, and that honestly, that's where psychology and social work can really help sort of smooth some of that playing field. So that the patient's not being stressed about who's making the decisions um, and that they're getting supported rightly. But yeah, EPOA and also when you come into hospital, advanced health directive about whether you want antibiotics, intubation, CPR, all that sort of stuff. And I, want, I think once again, we sometimes leave that a bit late because um, we want to treat. But I th And then some people think, oh, geez, they want, they want me to, to be going to my coffin already, but I don't feel that I'm that sick. So once again, it's a, it's a balance about communication 
you know, this is if things deteriorate, that's not what we're necessarily going to do now. And that, you know, as far as advanced health directives, these can change, that they're not sort of set in stone. So that patients are clear about, um, and they can just be general choices to, no, I don't want to go to ICU, you know, depending on how sick they are. Again, I feel quite privileged to um, have been a part of this webinar. Again, John, Ron, thank you very much for sharing your expertise this afternoon. I wish you all the very best in the days ahead. And don't forget that we are here for you. So all the very best and bye for now.